Good evening. It's good to be here. The title of my lecture is Remanufacturing, Remaking UK Manufacture. But really, I'm going to be talking about waste because we're immersed in it. Every minute each day, industry in England alone produces more than 308 tonnes of waste. That's equivalent to three and a half Boeing 737s at takeoff weight. So, if we are to address our waste issues, the solutions must begin and end with industry, which leads me to the heart of my presentation. Today, I'm going to introduce a different way of making products called remanufacture. Remanufacture is defined as an industrial process which takes waste products, used products, and returns them at least to the same performance specification as they were when new and, giving the same, and give them the same guarantee as would be given new products. Now, this process is not entirely new. It's just very unknown and undeveloped. The first study of remanufacture, in fact, the greatest study of remanufacture that's ever been done is a 10-year study conducted between 1972 and 1982 and paid for by the, by the World Bank. And this study aimed to determine the implication for remanufacturing for developed countries and for developing nations. However, because the study was driven by the US, it tended to dwell a lot on the impact of remanufacturing for the US economy. Now, this study determined that in the late 1970s, that's more than 45 years ago, there were more than 73,000 companies engaged in some form of remanufacture or other, and together, these companies brought in more than $53 billion to the US economy. $53 billion a year, that's a lot of money for one country. If you extrapolate it to today's currency, it's even more. <clears throat> so, in the next slide, I'm going to explain the significance of remanufacture. And the key thing about remanufacture is that it takes waste uh, used products and returns them into the manufacturing cycle, thereby saving landfill, processing, energy and new material and other resource whilst at the same time maintaining product quality. I'm going to use this simple diagram of the production cycle to try and explain the benefits of remanufacture in comparison to conventional manufacture and in comparison to end-of-life processing um, activities such as <coughs> recycling, which is the most uh, predominant way that we manage end-of-life products. Now, in conventional manufacture, sorry, I don't have a pointer. That's the conventional manufacture here, highlighted in line. Raw material is extracted from the earth and is pre-processed by the primary producer. The pre-processed material are then given to the product manufacturer who uses them to make products. The products are sold to the, to the user and when they are finished with it, they dispose of those products <coughs> as waste and they enter landfill. Now the idea of remanufacture is to arrest the waste product on disposal but prior to landfilling and then to reintegrate the components back into the production cycle, <coughs> saving in terms of the environment, uh, waste to landfill and extraction of raw material to fuel the production process. The economic savings are all the energy and the source that would have been used in landfilling the used product, all the energy and the source that would have been used in extraction of raw material and all the energy and resources that would have been used in pre-processing the raw material and the bulk of the energy and resource that would have been used to make the product. Now, if we take into account the circumstances of modern manufacture, where you extract the raw material in Africa, then you move it all the way to the other side of the planet, somewhere maybe to the east, where we have low labour costs, and you pre-process the raw material, you drag the raw material by air or sea 
to another part of the globe, maybe somewhere in China or India or maybe in Eastern Europe, and you make the components. And then you bring the components to developed countries like the US, Germany, and the UK, and you simply assemble the product. Because that's what we do. We don't really make a lot of things in the UK. We assemble. So if you take into account that, all the energy and resource and the carbon that's in impl implicit in that is a lot. Now, in comparison, I'm now going to compare remanufacturing with recycling. The key difference there is that recycling is a process of reduction, while as remanufacture is a process of addition, because remanufacture takes the waste product and adds, uh, and adds value to it by bringing it back to working order, and in fact, working order that's equivalent to a new product and verifies that with as new guarantee. Recycling, on the other hand, takes something that we've already put energy and resource into making and reduces it to the value of its raw material, thereby losing the bulk of energy and resource input into that product in its first manufacture. And in fact, we use energy to do that reduction. For example, if you had a structure made of metal, to recycling it, you add energy and resource to smelt it. Then you have to, to do something with that uh, material. You have to add further energy and resource to turn it into products that people can use. So we recycling, we use energy twice, three times. First, in making the product. Then we lose all that energy and resource by adding more energy. And then we add further energy to turn it into something useful. Now, I'm going to use the next slide to show, to quantify the benefits. So if you decide to, to produce something by remanufacturing as opposed to conventional manufacture, you get the same quality of products as conventional manufacture, but at more than eight, up to 80% cost savings because of reduced uh, processing and reduced virgin material use. We have even factored in the reduction in waste penalty. When we look at en environmental benefits, we get the same quality of products as conventional manufacture, but we use up to 80% less energy. And then when we look at the impact on landfill, it's quite convincing because up to 85% of the weight of a remanufactured product can come from used components that would otherwise have entered landfill. Then we can look at the societal benefits. Remanufacture enables us to tackle the key causes of social exclusion, which is lack of money and lack of jobs. And that's because remanufacture, like conventional manufacture, creates employment across the board, but remanufacture drives down production costs thus allowing manufacturers to put high-quality products into the market at prices that is affordable for everybody. Okay. One of the things about this era we're in, where we're all trying to be environmentally uh, friendly, is the amount of these words beginning with re. When we sort of do something with a product that has lived, we re something is recycled, is repurposed, is remanufactured, it is reconditioned. But what are the differences between these, uh, these uh, secondary market processes? So I'm going to use, use this diagram to explain the difference between repair, reconditioning, and remanufacture because of the ambiguity in definition surrounding them. So the key thing about remanufacture is that it's the only process that we know that can take a broken product and return it to the same quality as a new product and verify that with giving it a guarantee that's at least the same as a new product. So the key def the, the final feature is remanufacture is at the very top of the waste hierarchy or product recovery hierarchy. And the other defining feature is the idea of identity. If a remanufacture, if a product is remanufactured, it retains its identity. 
If it is reconditioned or repaired, it loses its identity. I'm going to use a very simple example to explain what I mean by identity loss and retention of identity. We are, a simple product we are fam- we're all familiar with could be a radio. So in a couple of years' time, there will be facilities which are set up specifically to deal with end-of-life products. So I take my radio to this facility and I say, I want a repair because my radio is no longer working because the play button isn't working. Repair is where you attend to the specified fault. So this person would take the radio from me and let attend to the play button. When I come to get back my radio, I get the same radio I gave them. If I have a guarantee, it applies to the play button because that is what I specified as failed. If I had, however, said, I want my radio reconditioned because the play button is not working, what that person will do is take the radio from me, they'll attend to the play button as well as the major wearing parts that are, have failed are on the point of failure, whether or not I have specified faults in them or notice faults in them. If I come back for my radio, I get the same radio I gave that person, and if I get, I get a guarantee, the guarantee applies to the play button as well as the major wearing parts. So reconditioning is a bit like a car overhaul. Now with remanufacture, I come back. I, get, I see before me a radio that looks like a mine but very new. If I, get a, I will get a guarantee that's at least equivalent to that of a new product. But it's not my radio. In a batch processing environment, I'll be lucky if one component in that radio I've been given belonged to the, to the radio that I gave this person. Because remanufacture is an, a production process that has as raw material use products. So I'm going to use the next slide to show how it is I have this item in my hand. And actually, it could be that not one component in it belonged to the uh, item I gave this person. So this is a typical remanufacturing process, simplified from this. So use products, that's my widget I want to remanufacture that comes in at the top. The first thing they're going to do is they find out what do I need to uh, bring this product to as new condition. So we'll assess it. What product is it? What model is it? What year of manufacture? What make? Once they have that information, then they go down to strips. Strip, strip simply means uh, disassembly, reduce the component level. And they will put my product together with other similar products and disassemble them to component level. They'll then go to, they'll then clean them together and then they'll go to remanufacture where they take each individual component and returns it at least to as new a quality in terms of performance. Then they put the clean components in store. In store, there's no differentiation between bought new components and remanufactured components because they are equal in quality. Now, when the assembly area calls for work, somebody in store would put, down, put together a kit. A kit is a casket or some container that, conta- that contains all the components that I need to make one widget. My widget has come in at the top. It's been disassembled with a lot of other com- uh, products that are similar widgets. They've been cleaned together and they've been put in stores. In store, all the uh, components of the same type are in, in one area. So when the kit is put together, it's very unlikely that one component will come from mine. That being the case, when I go to a remanufacturer and I say, I want my widget remanufactured, they immediately go to customer order. If there is not a 
product already remanufactured and sitting in store, they will simply call to, uh, to store and say, put together a kit and assemble it. It's no point because they don't wait for mine to be done, which is why remanufacturers can give you that 24-hour turnaround time. You don't get your product back. You get one that's completely manufactured from remanufactured components and bought new components. So a remanufactured component loses its uh, identity because they've remanufactured one we have. Maybe, if I'm lucky, one or two components from the widget are brought in, remanufactured components from other similar widgets, and new components to replace components that cannot be brought back to as new condition. So, like I said, the study by Lund, that's the 10-year study, was done between 1972 and 1982. So we got to look at have things changed so far. And one person that has been doing this is Professor Steinhilfer. He's German, I don't speak German, but I think he's Steinhilfer anyway. And he was looking at uh, what would be the implication if there were, we were to make automotive parts by remanufacture as opposed by conventional manufacture. And he, compare, he compared starter motors and automotors in terms of energy consumption and material consumption, remanufacture or, com, or, or um, conventional manufacture. And what he found was that for alternators, you can produce a, a lock in it, uh, the same quality as new manufacture using 14% uh, energy and 12% um, material compared to conventional manufacture. And then when you look at starter motors, you can produce the same uh, quality of starter motor, 9% uh, energy use and 11% energy use compared to conventional manufacture. That's quite a big impact. Now, because of the situation we find ourselves in with resource insecurity, there's been an increase in interest in remanufacture. Actually, one of the people that are driving remanufacture is the Scottish Government. And you can see here lots of studies, reports by the Scottish Government on how remanufacture can rejuvenate the Scottish, not just the Scottish economy, but economies world over. And currently, the value of remanufacture is 1.198 billion, that's the global market. Of this, Scotland has 1.1 billion. And then the future prediction is that by 2030, uh, the remanufacturing market will be worth 511 billion. It will create 580,000 jobs and save us 450 million tons of CO2. And then there are all the other emerging global opportunities such as the circular economy and low carbon market that remanufacture is an enabler for. So other considerations, resource insecurity. A study was done in uh, 2011, between 2011 and 2015 by McKinsey Group asking the top, uh, the top um, uh, companies in the world what they see as, clue, as uh, the threat to their existence. And the key thing they said was rising resource prices and resource insecurity. <coughs> At the same time, it so happens that 80% 80, 80 of manufacturing executives saw raw material shortage as the key business risk. And we, look, we can see why, because the key elements we need for producing high-tech products are gold, antimony, tin, and silver. As you can see, each of these are waning. 
we have 45 years of gold left, 30 years of antimony, 40 years of tin, and 29 years of silver. That's quite a lot. Okay. So really, because of this, we need a secular economy in order not just to become compet to remain competitive, but to be able to continue trading and manufacturing in the future. And I think this is from the Scottish government as well. Effective raw material usage can save, the Scot can save Scottish businesses one billion pounds a day, a year, a year, one billion pounds a year. And that's for a country with, with just five million people. So another reason uh, for increased interest in remanufacture, these emerging, uh, emerging global opportunities. Um, we've had here from Ellen MacArthur that remanufacture and refurbishment could save the EU, could save EU manufacturers 630 billion pounds per annum. We also know that the global low carbon market exceeded 3 billion, 3 trillion pounds in 2008. And this is the example of what the um, automotive uh, sector is worth at the very tooth uh, as well. So remanufacturing Scotland, we are quite lucky. Remanufacture already exists in key Scottish economic sectors. Not only that, Scottish is, uh, Scotland is ideally placed to take advantage of these opportunities because we have the right mix of skills. There's a lot of high-end engineering uh, skills in Scotland. We are an island. So, and all these big um, uh, remanufactured products tend to be big, chunky metal stuff. And these kits are moved by sea. Not only that, we have good transportation links within the country and outside, and outside it. I don't know why people get this idea that Scotland actually is isolated. No, it isn't. You can enter Scotland by sea, by land, by air. It's very easy to get around Scotland. That's a key advantage. Yeah, so I've shown this one. And at the Scottish Institute for Remanufacture, we also try to identify where the opportunities can come for people who want to enter this area within Scotland. As you can see, there are opportunities not just for people who are already remanufacturing, but for other businesses who might want to enter the remanufacture arena. So, Remanufacture is so wonderful. Why isn't it happening? Well, key things. Over the past 40 years, we've put in a lot of effort into enhancing conventional manufacture, developed wonderful business models, lots of tools and techniques. Well, remanufacture hasn't benefited from that. So the key issue why remanufacture is not growing is these technical and non-technical barriers. The technical barriers are lack of specific expertise. Even the people that are remanufacturing in Scotland are doing so, they're not, it's not optimised. It's just that the product they have are chunky bits of kits of metal and are amenable because of their, or because of their characteristics for remanufacture, but the remanufacturing is not optimised. So, key uh, technical barrier, how to do remanufacturing effectively. How do you design products for remanufacture? Inadequate tools and techniques. There are very few remanufacturing tools and techniques. I don't know of a single tool that's been delivered, de uh, developed specifically for remanufacture. So the remanufacturers tend to make do with the tools of conventional manufacturing but they're not ideal. They're not technical barriers. Lack of understanding and awareness. If you tell somebody someone something is remanufactured, they think, ah, it's worse than a new one. 
it's been repaired. So there are no flu that ambiguity in definition could have gone through, and the benefits are not widely understood. The customer perception, the idea that it's got poor image, a product that's lived before must be inferior to a, a, a new one. How can that be? So we're identifying products, defining them on the basis of how many life cycles they've had, rather than what is their quality, what is their functionality. There, and of course, there are very few policy and regulations that have been developed to encourage remanufacturing, but there's quite a few that are there and deter remanufacture. And one of them is that in the UK, if you have a widget and it's got maybe 2,000 components, and a single component within that 2,000 has lived before, you cannot call that product a new product. And that sounds out, sounds out a massive message because the government is saying if you have this product and you remanufacture a component in it, you can call it a remanufactured, you cannot call it a new product. It's automatically saying that products that have lived before are not as good as new ones. So, what do, does a remanufacturable product look like? And who are remanufacturers? Well, Rolls-Royce is one of our greatest remanufacturers. Rolls-Royce engines are remanufactured. That's why they brought the power by the hour. They, they develop their products and they sell your service for the product. And then they bring it back, they remanufacture it, give it back to you again. So they actually put it into the market several times. But no one thing, no one ever says actually, if remanufacturing was not, uh, doesn't make things, uh, bring out high quality products, would anyone fly? <coughs> That's what we have to think of ourselves. So Rolls-Royce, Fujitsu, BMW, Volvo, they're all remanufacturers. <coughs> and again, like I said, so what type of products are remanufacturable? Using the current technology we have, it just happens to be products that accidentally are remanufacturable because they are big chunks of metal and therefore valuable and durable and they have low process and product technology. But what we are trying to move now is to develop tools and techniques that will enable us to uh, remanufacture a wider range of products and to develop products that are amenable for remanufacture. And that's where the Scottish Institute for Remanufacture <coughs> comes from. Like I said, one of the people who are driving remanufacture is the Scottish Government. In 2015, I was given 1.3 million by the Scottish Government to start this centre as a hub of ex uh, expertise for remanufacture. And our, speci our specific re remit was to enlarge the extent of remanufacturing that happens in Scotland as a way of, of uh, as a mechanism for turning the Scottish economy circular by doing two things. Increasing the amount of remanufacturing that happens in Scotland by increasing the capacity of existing remanufacturers and enabling other remanufacturers to start up within Scotland. So this is what we do in a nutshell. We raise awareness, which is why I'm quite keen to do this talk. Uh, we transfer knowledge because there are distinct expertise in industry and also quite a lot of expertise in academia. And these, these two types of, uh, of uh, expertise must come together if we are to opt optimise remanufacturing. Um, we help the stakeholders, academia, uh, remanufacturers, public sector and trade associations to come together because we need everyone working together in order to optimise remanufacture. And of course, we fund industry-driven projects as well. So this is our key job, accelerating the move to a second economy in Scotland via product recovery.
before I describe before I try to describe one of two, a couple of the projects I'm involved in, I'm going to talk about one of two of the challenges of remanufacture. As I said, there has been a lot of attention given to conventional manufacture over the past 40 years. The challenge for remanufacture now is how to produce product at the cost and speed of mass production in conventional manufacture. When you compare remanufacture to manufacturing um, on a one-to-one -one base where you're outputting out one product at a time or small batches, remanufacture is very competitive. But once you move to a, a mass production scenario, remanufacture fails because the technology we have for remanufacture at the moment is low innovation and low level. It cannot compete. And to make it worse, we know that to, be, to remain sustainable, we need to flip this, this situation where we have at the moment, where over 98 of production happens via conventional manufacture. To be able to survive on this planet, we've got a few years to flip it so that at least 50% of our production occurs by product recovery, and even better, to get 70% by product recovery and 30% by new production. If remanufacture cannot compete when we talk about mass production in conventional manufacture, what's going to happen now that conventional manufacture is going through a fourth industrial revolution based on digitalization? We have to import those new technologies into the remanufacturing arena to be able to move the way we need to in order to survive. So, trying to enhance remanufacture, one of the things we're doing is concentrating on the critical, factor, the critical activities of remanufacture, and two of those are assessment, inspection, and disassembly. And you can see why from this. If you're remanufacturing something, you have to bring to as new condition every single component inside it. That means you have to be able to disassemble. If you're going to bring something back to as new condition, first of all, you've got to inspect it to find out what's its status, how far does it deviate from the uh, performance of the new product. Then you do work on it and inspect it. Unfortunately for us, the disassembly and inspection in remanufacture is very, they are very difficult, they are very manual processes, therefore they are slow, error prone and costly. Disassembly is the first, one of the first things you do, you get a product, you disassemble, cannot disassemble, you can't remanufacture. Suppose you're able to disassemble, you've got ins inspection, that's inspection there in brown, is most frequent activity that you undertake in remanufacture. But it is error-prone and costly. So if we're going to optimize remanufacture, we have to deal with these two critical, critical activities first and then look at other activities. So, the, one of the projects I'm going to introduce is called Large Scale Demonstration of New Circular Economy Value Chains Based on Reuse of End of Life Fiber Reinforced Composite. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful. So, so, we actually found an acronym that says exactly what we are trying to do Fiber Reuse. It's fiber reuse. So, the, the aim of this project is to, is to uh, find effective way of management, of managing end-of-life composites. Because we're using more and more composites in all areas of industry. And this trend is going to continue and even accelerate because of the advantages of use, using composites. You know, uh, lightweighting, corrosion resistance, and strength. 
But the problem is that manufacturing composites is very expensive economically and environmentally, but at end of life, there are only two reuse options. There are only two end of life management options for composite structures, and that is landfill or recycling. So we are trying to see how we can get higher value reclaiming of used composites in this project. This is our 9.8 uh, million uh, project funded through the European Horizon 2020 program. We have 21 partners uh, from seven EU uh, countries. Of those 21 partners, only five are universities. So it's a very industry-driven project, and it has to be, because if we are going to develop solutions that are going to be taken on board by industry, then we need the voice of industry in that project. Moreover, we need industry to do more of these collaborative projects because industry is the cause of our waste issues. Oh, yeah. And this map shows, that's the, shows the, uh, the collaborators in this project and their location in the various areas of Europe. So the aim of the further reuse project is to demonstrate profitable reuse of end-of-life composite and on a large scale so that industry will take, take it on board. And we have identified three objectives that we need in order to meet these aims. The first one is to determine new profitable reuse options for end-of-life composites. And this involves developing new remanufacturing technologies and integrating them in order to, uh, in order to maximize their benefits. And the advantage of doing this is that it enhances ease of working with used composites, it reduces cost of both man of manufacture, and it also enables us to better meet EU directives on, on waste. The second one is find measures which will enhance, uh, enhance effective communication and coordination between and within all sectors that touch the uh, composite market. <coughs> This is necessary in order to advance potential for trade. By this I mean we want to use, um, uh, use composites. That means that the person with the waste composite must have visibility of the person who is going to make something with the waste composite. The person who is going to make something with the waste composite must know where the person with the waste composite is um, they must know what type of waste composite is available, what it will cost them, and what is the process that will be needed for them to get that waste, promise, waste composite in their premises in order to work for, with, with it. So here we're looking at really um, bringing together the network that we need in order to ensure trade in reuse composites. The third one is the one that, as engineers, we tend to ignore. All engineers want to look at technical factors because it's a lot more, it's very, it's a lot more tangible. However, the non-technical fa factors are actually, that's the elephant in the room. Suppose we had wonderful solutions for composites, but we haven't dealt with, the, with one little um, non-technical hindrance, which is customer uh, perception. Customers don't want, want to buy this product. It doesn't matter how good the solution is. So we need to address these non-technical factors. But no one wants to do it because it, it's not tangible. It doesn't seem as important as going around, running around, building robots. That looks a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, so the first one we want to look at is lack of market due to lack of understanding and knowledge of the properties of composite. And this results from key, two key factors. The first one is ambiguity in definition of reuse processes, which is why at the beginning of the presentation, I tried to define and differentiate 
repair, reconditioning and remanufacture. The second one is what pro you cannot work with a material where you don't know its properties. With virgin composite, we, we make virgin composites, we know exactly what properties they have, what characteristics they have, and therefore what uses we can put them to. With used composites, we don't know that. All we know is its properties differ from that of virgin composites, and they might be contaminated. So, what do we do with them? So, uh, the other thing is low revenue. Used composites tend to be lower value than metals, and that doesn't attract uh, uh, businesses because it's low value, they don't want to work, they want money. And, uh, and of course, lack of supporting legislation and incentives to encourage composite reuse. That's not specific to composite, that's every, every reuse uh, operation has problems because there aren't the legislation and the incentives to support reuse in general. So the predicted solutions is new service oriented business models. I've already said that the business models of conventional manufacture, that is product sale, is not ideal for remanufacture or um, reuse, op or that reuse operations. So we need to develop new innovative business models that will encourage trade in reuse operations and reuse products. We need to optimize the reverse logistics network architecture. Now, the reverse logistics is the process by which they, uh, they use composites gets to the person that's going to work with it. Currently, that, uh, that system is broken. It's not systematic. And a lot of damage can actually occur on the used, uh, used uh, composite on its way to get to the person that's going to use it. Okay, what is it? And we also, we are talking about um, uh, uh, sustainable solutions. So we have to undertake a life cycle analysis on all our, on our, our solutions. That is, analysis to determine what is the environmental impact of those solutions before actually proposing them. Last, I'm going to jump to, jump to the beginning because I don't know how long until I've got left. And last but not least, we want to show the remanufactured parts in both a virtual and a physical product library. We want people not just to read about it, but to come and see, touch and feel the products. Because that way people have better understanding and then they can decide, do they want to buy these products or do they want to enter a business where they are making such products? So the, the fiber reuse project is based on implementing three micro use cases which are composed of eight demonstrators. Use case one is, uh, is the use of mechanically recycled short uh, fibers from construction industry and reusing them in added value customized applications in furniture, sports, and creative products. <coughs> Use case two is thermal recycling of long fibers uh, from wind turbine and aerospace and reusing them in high tech, high resistant applications such as automotive. And Use case three is inspection, repair, and remanufacture of end of life uh, parts in high-tech applications. And this is where Scotland is represented by Strathclyde. Yeah, because that's, like I said, we're known for, we're known for remanufacturing, but we're also known for things like non-destructive evaluation as well. I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, so this, this is uh, the concept that we're using. We're trying to... Uh, uh, have a synergetic, holistic uh, view of the problem. So we're drawing together the uh, enabling technologies and processes with digital innovation and with a cross-regional value chain uh, building. And this is necessary. It is necessary to have this systematic approach that fuses together a lot of knowledge enabling technologies if we are going to achieve circularity in manufacture and use 
of composites in Europe. So I'm just going to show you some of the demonstrators, some of the solutions we, that we have. And the first one I'm going to show is uh, the objective, the demonstrator based on use cases two and three. And the objective here is to design reuse-oriented modular, modular design of composite cars. And this is led by DAG, who are design, uh, design and manufacture um, cars. So the aim here is to enable multiple useful life of automotive structures through a circular economy design method methodology. And this combines use case two and three because the inspection techniques developed in use case three will then be required to enable reuse of carbon fibers from use cases two. So in use case three, we develop new NDE technology because like I said, to be able to use these uh, waste products, we've got to know their characteristics. So we de develop new NDE techniques to enable us to determine their properties and their characteristics. And that enables us to develop outputs in use case two. If we don't have the ND techniques, we don't know the properties, therefore we cannot use. <coughs> so the advantage of this concept is that it enables a circular economy by increasing reuse, that's one, and also by increasing new businesses based in around reuse. I'm going to demonstrate this in the next slide. So our, cur our current method of, uh, uh, is our current business model, conventional mo business model, is product sale. And we are using here a best, best case scenario where in product sale, we're actually using, uh, uh, com we're actually integrating uh, waste product in the manufacturing cycle. So, we can have an OEM calling uh, call them company A. It develops and distributes a car to the first user. The first user uses this car for about 15 years and then discards it. Then another business for example, a colleague business uh, company B, that's a dismantler, disassembles the discarded car and sells the components. We have a new company come, an end-of-life operator, and buys the major parts from the dismantler, recovers and reinforces it, then sells it back to company A, who purchases the refurbished and, uh, and enhanced uh, uh, component parts and then integrate it into the new car production. That's the best case scenario you can get for a product sale, conventional manufacturer. You have someone who's actually using a waste material, uh, integrating it into their production cycle. But, so you have here ABC, that's three businesses created. So we have three businesses created and we also have some reuse, that's quite good. But let's go to, product, to the product service system. Here, you have a company A, call it a car sharing company, and it com commissions the design of a car based on a platform that enables uh, use of, um, of composites in the manufacturing cycle, of used composite. Company B, the manufacturer, builds the car, and the car is then used for car sharing for about 45 years. At the end of that, it is disassembled by company C, who, which is a dismantler. <coughs> company D, the end-of-life operator, recovers and reinforces the major components. And company B, the manufacturer, integrates the recovered component into the production of new cars for the car-sharing company. So you can see, in all these cases, you have reuse which is good, but in the second case for the service system, you have A, B, C, D. There are, there are actually four different businesses created. And I'm just going to show you some of the redesigns that, that we have been developing. And this one is looking at uh, a redesign of the car frame. 
to enhance durability and ability to absorb impact by integrating waste composite into their, into their design. We chose the car frame because it's an expensive kit and it has to be strong because it contains the battery and provides protection from impact. You can see here, we've made it stronger by integrating, where you've got the, the green bit there, is actually uh, the recycled composite, where the composite, where waste composite we're putting in there. So the design consideration is to opt optimize reuse, uh, effective business model, and waste reduction in production. So in terms of optimizing reuse, we're doing it in two ways. Firstly, we, uh, although we are using new raw material in the first manufacture, the parts have several, have many lives. So we're having a lot of reuse of parts there. Secondly, the redesign includes addition of recycled composites to enhance stiffness and crash performance. So we have two instances of reuse. <coughs> Firstly, the, the products go around several life cycle. And secondly, we also add recycled um, um, uh, material in the new design. So our progress is that so far we have been successful in incorporating uh, recycled material in, first, in the first design. We have validated it, but we want to have more, of a, a more um, robust validation. Uh, in terms of... Um, waste reduction, we're using sheet moulding compound as a manufacturing method because A, it is effective, it is flexible and, uh, and scrap is reduced. And, first, and then to enhance uh, the use of business models and reuse again, we're using a modularity for ease of assembly and disassembly. Again, enhancing reuse. Okay, yeah. So, so this is, uh, so you can see the components separate about which makes it a lot easier to actually remanufacture uh, the car. Okay. Uh, this is another of uh, thing that we are, uh, we've, uh, we're, we are redesigning. And this, this is the storage, storage platform redesign. Uh, we have made it stronger by adding new elements uh, that's shown in, in green. And those new elements are actually made from recycled uh, composites that would have otherwise have gone into landfill. One of the things we talked about was the fact that of uh, user perception, lack of market. And the way we're addressing, we're addressing this, in this, uh, in this project is by trying to find solutions for co-creation. And the concept there is to integrate the customer voice in the design in order to enhance the market potential, i.e. if the general public is involved with the designer in designing the product, then there's a great chance that they are more likely to buy it. And this is demonstrating for uh, use case one. So, the aim here is to promote circularity and eliminate waste by changing products and processes. And the key objective is to create new material from waste and determine the best uses for them, and also to determine measures to prevent waste of remanufacturable products, i.e., making sure that products that can be remanufactured do not enter landfill. And our solution for this is a co-design methodology that involves the general public in designing new products from used components. So the process we're using for this is that design designers create product ideas from waste material, waste composite. The general public vote for the best uh, design ideas, and then the selected ideas are advanced and realized as part of our <coughs> solutions. So in order to enable communication between the general public and their designers, we rely on IT to enable 
this communication that, that we need. So we have a, with, with a web-based tool to collect new ideas, to tag the, the ideas with, with uh, keywords, and then to wait and comment them, and then ask for external feedback via questionnaires and surveys, and then create concepts by merging the different ideas uh, based on the best ones that the uh, general public have selected. So this is an uh, example of some of the example of the ideas that the designers have come up with. And many of these solutions use recycled glass reinforced polyester glebonite because of its processing advantages. <coughs> it's easy to color, so you can have good aesthetic qualities. And also a variety of, of processing methods can be used <coughs> for, uh, for processing uh, glebonite products. And this is an example of some of the things that have come out so far. This is a glebonite modular stacking system. Its uses are for attractive road barriers or for indoor and outdoor benches or tables. The advantage is glebonite <coughs> blocks are vandal proof and so it's suitable for indoor and outdoor. It's flexible because it's modular and stackable and a wide range of shapes can therefore be made. Oh, sorry, I've gone down. This is another one. Again, all these are from uh, waste that would have entered landfill. And um, these are tableware for putting uh, drink bottles in. And also, they can be assembled for outdoor furniture, like deck chair. And the advantage here is tough, so it can be used for indoor and outdoor. Again, that is glebonite. So this is there used for... Um, for outdoor furniture, desks and bar table. And the next slide, I'm going to show you where the same material is being used for a wine cooler. And again, using glebonite, this is uh, trying to repla replace marble taps. And this is by Giominelli Design, and it's tiles for internal or outdoor use. Again, from the, all these um, all this material would normally have entered landfill. And by the way, uh, the cutting of this uh, is by water jet. Again, saving energy. So, uh, the next uh, project I'm going to talk about is the EU Vanguard Initiative for e Efficient Sustainable Manufacturing, ESM for short. <laughs> This project came about because the EU identified that there are particular regions in the EU with specific expertise related to sustainable manufacture. So its idea was to bring these uh, regions together to collaborate so that they can develop uh, enabling technologies that can be given to manufacturers as a way of pushing forward a sustainable manufacture capability in the EU. So the idea is to develop a network of demo sites at regional level. These networks would then uh, get problems uh, related to sustainable manufacture from manufacturer, manufacturers, and then they'll work with the expertise in the region from universities and technology providers to, prov to um, bring out the high-tech solutions that industry needs. The reason that this is being, put, uh, is being addressed is that for the past 30 years or so, the EU has been giving a lot of money to uh, academia to produce solutions to address sustainable manufacture. The solutions pr pr uh, produced are very good, but they never find their way to industry because of two key drawbacks. First of all, a cost of impl implementation, the companies can't afford it. And secondly, it's also lack of expertise on how to implement and how to operate the new technologies. So the advantage of this approach is a collaborative and joint approach to address EU sustainable manufacture issues. It's a common EU approach and therefore prevents uh, wastage, for example, by doubling up of resource. 
If you look at the research that are at the moment being undertaken in Europe, you might find that is one research being done in France, and it's very similar to the one in Italy, very similar to the one in Germany. So the idea here is to pull all the, all the expertise and resources together so that we can save money. And, and also use the best uh, brains for the work. So, the expertise that uh, Scotland has been identified uh, as having is free manufacture. As a result, the ESM, there are 11 ESM categories, and one of the categories that Scotland is involved in is the ESMD and free manufacture pilot network. And there are seven regions involved in that project with us. There can be two types of network. One is new infrastructure where everything starts from scratch and everything is developed from scratch, they, um, uh, specifically for the pilot network, or you can have an upgrade. Scotland is going for an upgrade because we already have a lot of existing infrastructure. So what we are looking for is more money and more high-tech equipment to up what we have. So uh, another reason why we are going for upgrade is also that it is less risky. Italy, uh, Polini in Italy, is going for everything completely new, but it's too risky. We'd rather start, we have a lot of uh, expertise here already, a lot of equipment, we want to add to it, rather than just leave everything and start from scratch. So the value proposition here is using EU funds to upscale manufacturing capabilities of companies, <coughs> manufacturing companies' capabilities for sustainable manufacture. And there are 50 million uh, euros available to be shared between the seven regions involved. The benefit for the, co benefit for the companies, manufacturers and we manufacturers is that it de-risks their investment in enabling technology by addressing the key barriers, which are cost and also um, lack of expertise. So the process for this project is to develop the enabling technologies that are required by the companies and then to showcase, showcase them in a demonstration site. The companies then see how the, uh, the technology looks like, how it's used, and if they so wish, they can then get money from the EU, European Investment Bank, to replicate that technology at their own premises. That's what large companies will do, while the small companies will just prefer to get money from the EU and access on a pay-as-you-go basis. Now, within the D and we manufacture pilot network, uh, uh, Scotland has been chosen to lead and we are uh, one of the areas looking at past manufacture in the transport sector. And there are four regions involved in that, Lombardy, Norte, Tampere, and Scotland leading. And um, they, the committed stakeholders so far are the regional governments, the companies, and also the technology providers as well as the end users from, the, from these four regions. And this multi-regional approach is required because there's a lot of expertise out there in Europe, in Scotland and elsewhere, but they're not coming together, so our advancing is, is not effective or efficient. By taking this uh, approach, um, uh, we pull the talent and we also ensure that we reduce wastage because of, uh, of um, um, uh, how shall I say, because, we reduce, because of subsystem optimization. So barriers to um, industrial uptake of new te technology, a lack of knowledge of how to implement and how to operate the new technology. And the Vanguard Initiative is addressing this by providing ready-to-use uh, solutions, that is GR7 to GR8, with full support infrastructure. 
So some of the uh, enabling innovations we want to establish are innovations to enhance profitability, and there we're looking, really looking at digitalization, Industry 4.0, so aut autonomous inspection and disassembly, because this reduces lead time and reduces cost and improves accuracy. We're looking at um, uh, automating inspection and data handling, and then combining the two to deliver smart inspection. Again, this reduces lead time and cost and improves accuracy. And we also want to look at automated disassembly because this reduces lead time. So again, uh, to com if you're the, the key ways of competing in the modern industry are lead time, cost, and responsiveness. So here we're looking at how can we use digital, digitalization to enable that. Okay, and the other thing is enlarging the market. And again, we're using digitalization to ensure uh, coordination and, uh, uh, and communication. Uh, to, in order to enhance trade potential. So these are examples of some of the machine the equipment we have already for the Scottish node of the D and B manufacture uh, um, uh, Vanguard idea. And so we have extend, extended range of robotic systems, metrology and NDT capability. And we are linked to over 10 centers of expertise. The companies there are the ones that have already signed up. Uh, so we are looking for more equipment and more money to add to this from Europe. And we will get it because we don't leave officially for, I think, two years. So, we'll, <laughs> so, so we will get it. Yeah. So how does Scotland um, compare with the rest of the world? Well, all the major economies, China, America, have identified product recovery, things that we manufacture, as enable, enablers for future competitiveness. So now there's a global race to build national uh, capabilities, that skilled workforce, especially supply chain and legislative framework to exploit the emerging, technology, emerging opportunities. All the major industrial regions, US, Taiwan, China, Singapore, Germany, and Scotland have a center of expertise for remanufacture. In fact, one of the reasons that the Scottish government was so keen to set up the Scottish Institute for Remanufacture, because we look around the globe, China has one, um, you know, Taiwan has it, US has it, but that's not in the UK. So basically, the Scottish government went on a limb and said, they're going to establish one because they can't wait for the UK to have one. It's moving too slowly. But if you look at Scotland and China, China is improving expertise. The state policy strongly supports we manufacture as new developed area. And, in, and for since 2000, a remanufacture has been appearing consecutively in China's five-year uh, five plan. In 2004, it was promoted as a key area in the state secular economy pilot project. So, and recently has lots of legislation and incentives for the remanufacture in China. So we're doing well for Europe, but you know, other people, when you look at China, we're not doing so well, and other people are catching up. So thank you. And I'd like to, if you want to know a, lot, a bit more about what we do in the SIR, we do have our annual event on the 17th of June, and it's going to be at the, uh, at the Tick Building in George Street. Please feel free to join us. Mm -hmm. particularly on cars, 
is that it is impossible to take the, the component apart without destroying it. And I think that has to be addressed by original manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the original card manufacturer has to take on board that we manufacture parts do not affect the guarantee of the car. <coughs> BMW in particular are bad for us. For example, I had a first day pump fail for my wife's money. Unfortunately, she wasn't driving at the time, but that's another thing. All I needed was four new seals. Cost of the new part, 800 pounds. Cost of the seals, 10 pounds. But to take the seals apart, you had to destroy the first day pump. Yeah. If that can be addressed, I think we're going in the right direction. I'm often remanufactured at original equipment manufacturer's guarantees. Yeah. I think that's the way to go. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's good. Uh, you can have over there. Oh, sorry. Yes. No? As you can see that. Uh, Remanufacturing aircraft engines is, uh, is obviously logical because yeah. they have a long life. Mm -hmm. We don't sit in a plane thinking, I wonder how old the engine is. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, <coughs> if you have a car which is 15 years old, it's remanufactured, who's going to want to come buy a car to design it which is 15 years old? Is it not a bit of a problem when it comes to the automotive industry? I, I think that's where one of the sets we're looking at. Um, you know, you can design a car, well, I don't, a car or any structure so that it can sort of serve the next user. For example, in the construction business, what we're trying to do is to have buildings that can serve the different for different um, new user. So depending on the way you design the car, it might be possible to implement uh, advances in it. Yeah. To update it. Yeah. I'd like to speak to the master. Can you can ask a question, please? Um, yeah. Do you think what's the word of the energy left is called? Yeah, sorry? So it's a bit confusing. Could we have your question, please? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Well, it's okay, thank you. No. The man in the third Is it one of the problems that we have to persuade the public not to want the newest thing every year? For example, not when we see young people want to make this. Uh, because it looks better or newer than last year's. I know that lots of grandpas and grandmothers uh, inherit the other phones, but the, this idea of news is best, mm -hmm. and therefore we need to have it. We have to change public attitude first. That, that, that is true. That's what I mean about the, one of the non-technical factors. But also a lot of this thing is driven by actually the manufacturers they, they drive that want is marketing. I, I've got a contract with three, and I have to, every, it used to be every year they'd give me a new model of mobile phone, and now it's every two years, but you want to hang on to your old one, but you find actually, it won't actually work after a while. They will give you a new one every two years. So I think you have to blame the, not just the young people, but marketing and the OEMs, yeah. I'm interested in the social and political aspects to this. You didn't really talk much about that. I mean, is it possible, for example, to give tax incentives to manufacturing companies who remanufacture? And it can be made trendy to drive a 45 year old car body that's been remanufactured. And it strikes me that there's a social dimension to this which could really help. I, 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 think, I think so, I agree. What we're trying to fight for, or we manufacturers are trying to fight for, is to be given some sort of recognition for the good they do. So you could get tax breaks for something, I think they deserve that. 
and can it be made trendy? I think so. I think if you had maybe Brad Pitt or something driving something old, other people would. I don't know if this is a true story, but once someone told me that one of the Queen's nephews is a carpenter, and he actually makes, I don't know, or he actually makes these, um, these um, you know, chairs and whatever that got three legs, and people would buy these chairs and tables because they want a royal furniture. So I don't know if it's true, but, you know, so it's really the marketing has to, has to come first, I think. It ties in with what the gentleman was saying about perception. Yeah. I have a question on the back. Yes, thank you very much, and good evening. I have a question about the perception and the perception of the I understood that remanufacturing includes remanufacturing a machine, an object, but all the material itself. Um, I think I understood that correctly. Um, I have just one thing to say. Uh, I have been visited a lot of places in Europe, and I have almost never seen a place like Scotland where virtually the money is dropped into the litter bin because there's almost total absence of any um, of any separation of uh, of uh, trash. So um, it's, I have not basically I've never seen it. I have just spoken with a colleague a few days ago, ago and he mentioned in Malta uh, basically people are identified if they are separating their residues in the correct way. So as I said, um, coming back to the gentleman who spoke before, that is an um, it's, uh, there is a problem. There is a, a, so, um, a problem in society. In society problem. My question just now is, as I said, I think that here in Scotland, um, separating trash is almost absent. It's absent everywhere. Basically, you you are asked to drop all the the, the different kinds of uh, material into the same box, and I can't really believe that this is being separated. And uh, my question now is, is that somehow addressed? that um, separation of residue will be implemented or strengthened or enforced or something like that. Thank you. This lady here, please. Um, thank you very much for the most interesting talk. I do wonder whether there isn't a need for a differentiated strategy for what you talk about remanufacturing for large chunky bits of metal that may be utilized within industry and within industrial value chains and the way remanufacturing might be designed for more uh, consumer value chains and that there is a, perhaps a need to to differentiate those two separate processes of remanufacturing. So you're saying there should be different processes for remanufacturing industry stuff and also for an, an, a different one for consumer goods? I, I'm, I'm wondering whether there is a need, whether you see a need for remanufacturing big chunky stuff like on the slide behind you and the processes associated with that within your networks uh -huh. and the remanufacturing that may be required in the consumer buy-in for the more consumer short-term um, products that we all get through every day because I can see some different um, issues that are raised and different opportunities between manufacturing value chain reuse and remanufacturing and consumer value chain. So whether you see those as different or actually having exactly the same drivers for the future. Oh, hang on, can I? Are you talking about the process of the of the driver? Because when you first began talking, I what came to my mind is if you're talking about big chunks of metal, remanufacture is there, but once you move into consumer products, you have reuse because there's a lot of plastic in those things and they don't have as much value. So normally you're refinding out how can you reuse them in some way. But while as you don't tend to, for example, remanufacture domestic washing machines, because the cost of remanufacturing them would be a lot greater than the cost of buying new. 
Mm -hmm. I, I had this instance because I had, um, when I was doing my, I was a student, my brother was just finishing his medical degree and he gave me, and he gave me a microwave oven. Now, I, I studied in England, but I was actually raised in Scotland. So, finished my, uh, my PhD, and I was going back to Scotland. Maybe somewhere in the van, something went wrong with this big, one of those big ones made of metal. So then I called someone to fix it, and he said, actually, do you know what? By the time you take into account my collar charge, and also, I think what's missing, what's wrong with it is this tiny little thing has, uh, has uh, spun out or orbit or something, but you don't get this little thing, you can't buy it on its own, on its own. you have to get this big bag and within it you get this little thing. So it's going to cost you about, you know, it's going to cost you about uh, maybe 50 quid by the time I finish. Why don't you go to Argos? And get uh, and get a new one for 19 quid. That's what I did. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. So I find that when you're talking about remanufacture for consumer goods, it doesn't really apply. It's you really reuse, but for uh, yeah, with our current technology. Yeah, yeah. Big chunky bits are metal, easy. Right, we have one question up there, and then I think we'll have time for one more question. Uh, hardly working. Um, can I go from the beginning? Um, yeah. You mentioned something about uh, law courts to labor and going east, something like that. Yeah. And then in the middle of your talk, you are concentrated on Scotland, which is not very east. But <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, if you're going east, then the cost of labor is a little bit different than the conventional wisdom today because of the learning curve cost of labor is becoming a little bit more expensive. Ah. Can you um, say some, something about a ratio between the excess energy used and the benefit obtained from this process? Have you, I, I saw a lot of figures that they yeah. were all about uh, net cost rather than actually benefits. Uh, hang on, um, hang on. Can I, can I see? You tell me if this is what you mean. Uh. <laughs> How can you get this? Sorry, taking a while to get back. I'm quite sure this is. How do I get back to the beginning if I use. Hang on. I, I did mention energy. Yeah, I wasn't thought. Yes, I, I don't think these figures and then a ratio between the energy, excess energy use, which is not there. And the benefit obtained from actually the process of remanufacturing. Did it, you mean like this one? Tell me if this is what you mean. Uh, sorry, I'm going down. Uh, uh. Does that answer it? No. No? Um, no? Anyway, um, uh, and the other thing is how do you deal with the change of use and licensing? You may actually take a part that is a manufacturer's patent or a license. How do you deal with this issue? I don't know. That, 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 that is some of the issue. Like I said, there has been very little work done on remanufacture, but that would be, that would be a problem um, dealing with patents. That would be a problem. Yeah. That we have a long way to go. Do, do we have one man question? Is there any legislation? Uh, just hold on to the microphone, please. Is there any legislation coming out of the EU to force car companies to have a percentage of the manufactured products? Because quite frankly, I don't think they'll do it. No, I think they're too powerful. <laughs> they're too powerful. I've been to quite a few uh, talks in Westminster where you are talking what you can do and everything, and at the end, they call in a lot of these manufacturers, and what you find is they, they just do what they want. It's like the MPs are quite frightened of them, really. They're too far. To, to the best of my knowledge, there's no legislation. They're going to be forced to electrify all their cars, remove diesel engines, new legislation. They probably want to do that. They have to do it. Mm -hmm. So, 
I, I think the only way this is going to work yeah. is actually have laws. laws. Um, I think there's a question, please. Right. Just one very quick one then. The man in the red. Go to the microphone, please. Remanufacture the two ferries in Ferguson GR. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that was a fantastic lecture. Um, I, I certainly learned a lot. I didn't know that 15% uh, MG, or well, remanufacture gets down to 15% MG material use. Um, that, that, that's amazing. Uh, Lord Kelvin, who, as Tricia said, was twice uh, president of the society and who's busted with us today, uh, he said a lot of things. Uh, one thing he said was that Science is bound by the everlasting vow of honour to face fearlessly every problem which can be fairly presented to it. And we clearly have major problems with sustainability at the moment. He also said the life and soul of science is its practical application. And I think what we've heard today is about technology that's being developed and systems that are being developed that can help us to solve these problems in, in a way that is very much in the spirit of development and advancement that Kelvin was so keen on. I was also uh, taken by the fact that non-destructive uh, evaluation uh, was, is so important. Clearly, Kelvin was all about measurements, saying that if you can't, until you can measure things, you don't know anything about them. I, I, I think, so this has been a fantastic lecture, very much in the spirit of Kelvin, and I hope you'll agree that uh, Dr. Winifred Ajoma is a very a worthy recipient of the Kelvin Medal.